<clears throat> the gospel makes evil-minded men good and good men better and women and children better than they've ever been before, so said the prophet David O. McKay. I would like to illustrate this by sharing with you a conversion story. The account concerns uh, Louis Novak, a Lutheran minister, his wife Alice and their two children, Kurt and Kristen. Reverend Novak and his wife had been born, baptized, raised, confirmed, and married in the Lutheran Church. It was with a sense of pride on the part of his parents and a sense of duty on his own part that he went through two private Lutheran colleges and a Lutheran theological graduate school to become a, a pastor in the American Lutheran Church. For nearly 14 years, he and his wife served in the Lutheran Church and endeavored to find peace and truth in their service. During this period, from all external appearances, they were able to attain a level of income, a style of life, social stratum, and education, which left little to be desired. With such stability and high approval from family and friends and supervisors, it could be said that they had it made, but they were not satisfied. They had a haunting insecurity in their souls that something very basic and important was missing in their lives. They could not be satisfied. The soul that is honest in heart must search. In Reverend Novak's words, as I look back on my life and my experience, I realize my dissatisfaction stemmed from a number of areas. First, I had a deep and negative reaction to the association of my fellow pastors. The strong and seemingly overwhelming stress on church politics, self-advancement, personal glory, financial achievement, and congregational statistics made me feel that the true spirituality I was looking for was seriously lacking. Second, I had deep theological concerns. The order of worship service seemed cold and personal and unimaginative. The great stress on salvation by grace and the minimization on works was a scriptural contradiction. In contemplating scripture, I found the work passages far exceeded the grace passages. I found myself recoiling at the indifferent reaction of my church leadership to the virgin birth, the creation, the wide acceptance and use of loose translations of scriptures, and the general lack of response to basic Christian morals. Was God really dead, or had he gone into retirement and ceased to care about his creation? Why did he sink into strange and sudden silence with the last word in the Bible? On October, on October 1st, 1968, Reverend Novak and his family moved to Bloomfield, Colorado, where he was made pastor of the Lutheran Church of Hope, a very prestigious and desirable assignment. From all outward appearances, it left nothing to be desired. But there was something desperately wrong. Something was missing. There was a spiritual hollowness in his heart, and it was equally shared by his wife, Alice. Alice was a music educator, and in Bloomfield, she had a number of Latter-day Saint students. She could not help but notice something very special about them. She reported to her husband she had asked one of her little Mormon students if Mormons were Christian. Of course, Reverend Novak knew the, the Lutheran Church position that Mormons were not Christian. The little Mormon girl, however, boldly stated that Mormons most definitely were Christian. Alice was touched by this little girl's testimony. Next came an invitation from the family of one of the piano students to attend the Bloomfield Ward Open House. The young student's family had resisted because they didn't think it was appropriate to send such an invitation to a Lutheran pastor. But the little girl persisted to the point where the parents reluctantly consented. On the appointed day, Alice was unavailable to, unavailable to attend, and Reverend Novak was hosting a regional meeting of the Lutheran Church of Hope. But as the time of the open house arrived, he had a strange and overpowering urge to leave the Lutheran meeting and attend. He yielded. As he entered the Latter-day Saint Chapel, he said he was met by a friendly and concerned gentleman who talked with him and stayed by his side for fully two hours, answering questions and just being supportive. The Reverend continued, as the program began, a, number, or a member of the 70s made a presentation on the doctrine of the church, which I am sure was inspired by the Spirit, he said. I shall never forget it. From the chapel, we were led to the baptismal font by a young priest who explained baptism according to the theology of the Latter-day Saints. This mature presentation by such a young man made a great impression, he said, because I had seriously questioned the Lutheran theology of baptism for years. I sensed that what this young man had said was really true. Then we went to the Relief Society room, where we were given a beautiful, intelligent presentation. To hear a lovely woman give such a positive and strong testimony was heartwarming to me. We were then ushered into the seminary room to view a film, Christ in America. I could hardly contain my excitement, so many of my questions regarding church history were suddenly answered. 
I was currently pursuing a doctorate in religion. Here I was, my doctrine nearly complete and my answers to my quest coming in the Latter-day Saint Chapel. It was probably at this time, said Reverend Novak, at the culmination of so much presented so well that I was actually converted. I knew that this had to be the true church. My heart was ready, but how could I become a part of it all? How hard it is to give up physical security and comfortable traditions. I purchased the Book of Mormon that day and went home elated. I remember telling Alice, there is something special there. I really felt good at that church. They have something I've never known before. The summer of 1974, after I received my doctorate, I was in spiritual turmoil. The Ward Open House remained a haunting reminder that something better was available. One evening, the mother of one of these Mormon students called regarding a musical question. For the first time, I bared my spiritual turmoil to a patient and understanding ear. Not long after, our family was invited to their family home evening. We came away so warmed. Yet how impossible it seemed for us to make such a change. My job, security, comfortable life, social standing, family ties, house, pension, it all flooded through my mind. Yet how does one in the name of Jesus Christ teach and preach that which he knows is not true? Finally, in the fall of 1974, although things were still going well at my parish, I knew in my heart that a change was necessary. I was spiritually starved, and I was even more concerned for the spiritual malnutrition of my family. And so it was, on October 25th, 1974, on an especially beautiful day in Colorado, as I left the University of Denver where I was pursuing a second doctorate, a strange and overpowering urge came upon me to go to the Colorado Mission Home. I had memorized the dress long before. And so although I had other pressing matters on my agenda, my automobile seemed to refuse to go anywhere except to 709 Clarkston Street. I kept telling myself I merely wanted to drive by to see what the mission home looked like. I remember, however, I did stop the car in front of the house, my intention being only to look at the place over from the outside. I remember sitting there for a moment intending not to shut off the engine, but somehow the engine did shut off. And I sat there and looked at my watch. It was noon, 12.35 p.m. I told myself it was inappropriate to call on anyone during the lunch hour. So I remember getting out of the car. I remember standing on the sidewalk at the base of the steps thinking, this is a nice place, now I'll just turn around and go back to the car. I have no business here. After all, I am a Lutheran pastor, but instead, I labored up those steps. I must have rung the buzzer because the door opened. <laughs> and there stood a bright-eyed missionary. He invited me in and said, I said, really, I, uh, I shouldn't be here today. Besides, it's lunch hour. He said, we're through eating. I almost panicked. Why was I here? How could I get out of this one? And so I said, I want you to know something. I'm a Lutheran pastor, and I'm here because I'm interested in all the world's religion. So I thought I'd just drop by and see what the Mormons are all about. I don't want to take too much of your time, because it's lunch hour. The young man explained again, we are through eating. <laughs> one thing led to another. All the while, I was reminding them that I was a minister of the gospel, and therefore not a good prospect. Somehow, we spent an hour or two I apologized upon leaving, said I had taken too much of their time. They wished me well, and I reminded them again that I was a Lutheran pastor and therefore not a prospect. But as I drove away, I had a warm feeling in my heart and yet a nagging fear that these good missionaries might believe that I wasn't a prospect. <laughs> One day later, the bright-eyed missionary telephoned me at my office in the Lutheran Church of Hope, of all places. I was so glad he called. During the conversation, he asked me if he and his companion would come over and meet my family the next evening. Two missionaries came to our home, and the process of our conversion continued step by step, logically, without hesitation. On January the 25th, 1975, three months and five hours exactly from the time I rang the doorbell at the Colorado Mission Home, <laughs> our family entered the waters of baptism at the Bloomfield Ward Chapel. After half a lifetime of searching, finally our joy was full. Kurt and Kristen relished the new challenge and associations of the church. They grew and matured beautifully. It was a joy to see them blossom as they learned the ways of Christ's true church on earth. Alice and I equally relished the joy of having found the truth. Our hearts were finally at peace. We had a great desire and a sense of urgency to go to the temple where we could have our family sealed for all time and eternity. As soon as we were able to go to the Salt Lake Temple following our first year in the church, we eagerly went. 
The support of so many people who accompanied us was tremendous. The sealing for all time and eternity was one of the most glorious occasions of our lives. The reason for the urgency of going to the temple and being sealed as a family was realized when just two weeks later, a tragic automobile accident claimed the life of our 11-year-old daughter, Kristen. As we stagger under the heavy loss and the grief of her mortal absence, and as our lives, or her absence in our lives, as we study and examine the process of the accident, we know in our hearts that it was the will of our Heavenly Father that her spirit was called unto Himself. We are strengthened and comforted in the knowledge that her joy is full. We have gratitude in our hearts that the timing of our Heavenly Father was so kind and merciful. At such a time, we can only ask questions and stand amazed as we ponder the answers. What if we had not joined the true Church of Jesus Christ and given this, Christ, this gift to Kristen? What if we had delayed our conversion to a more convenient time? What if we had not gone to the temple with such a sense of urgency when we did? What if we had not given Kristen the great joy of primary Sunday school, sacrament meeting, and family home evening? During the week before the accident, Kristen asked her mother if it would be possible for her to go back to the temple. She had loved it so. On a lonely Kansas cemetery, there stands a gray monument. On it are the names, the four names of our family. At the bottom are engraved these words, This family is sealed for all time and eternity. Behind the tears of temporary loss, our eyes show the clear and joyous knowledge that our decision was truly the correct decision. Surely the gospel does make good men better and women and children better than they've ever been before. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.